Howdy shipmates, long time no see. You should expect this from me now. I wish I was better at this. Uh, welcome back, welcome to the channel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Patrick Goodman. I am a freelance writer for the TTRPG industry. Been doing that for 25 years. For the past eight years, I have been working a lot, not as much as I'd like, but a lot, on the Star Trek Adventures role-playing game, which is what uh, brings me here today. Uh, unlike some of the reviews out there, I was not sent this book for, you know, the purposes of eliciting a review. I was sent this book so I could, you know, work. <laughs> I have writing gigs that were tied to, to needing this book. So, uh, like many of the freelancers, this was uh, delivered to me early. But I am going to make a review of it. My boss, Jim Johnson, uh, the project manager for the Star Trek Adventures uh, role-playing game, said it was a good idea. But regardless of how this book came to be in my possession, it's legit. You all will have it very soon. Uh, the uh, plan is to have physical copies at Gen Con with pre-order PDFs being released a week or so before. So in the next couple of weeks, uh, if I read everything uh, correctly, pre-orders will have this... Uh, arriving in their inboxes very, very, very soon. I think you guys are going to like it. Uh, there have been a lot of discussions on uh, on it being Doomsday because, oh my God, there's a new edition. Oh my God, there's a new edition. It's terrifying. It's horrifying. Don't get rid of your first edition books keep all of those they are going to be of enormous use to you uh if only for having so much lore in one place but with minimal work on anybody's part uh those books are still useful those books have tons and tons and tons of good stuff in them. So don't get rid of them. I know there's been a lot of panic about that. Uh, the plan is also that the books, the first edition books, will remain available in PDF. Reprinting them physically may not happen. I know they're looking into the possibility of doing print on demand, but we don't know yet. We'll get back to you. Um. So let's talk about this thing. This is the core rule book for Star Trek Adventures, second edition. Let's do a little bit of uh, window transitioning here. This is the standard cover. As you know, there are also three collector's covers, uh, Command Gold, Operations Red, Sciences Blue, uh, which I don't have pictures of at the moment, but let's face it, this book is gorgeous. The layout uh, inside, as you'll be seeing uh, shortly, is nice and clean. easy to read. There are a couple of places where I question the font choice and the, the color combination that goes with it, but I think that's just a testament to my old eyes. Uh, uh, I, I have reached an age where sometimes certain combinations aren't my friends, but let's get into this. Let's 
since we're looking at this this cover, let's just go straight to a discussion of the overall art in this book because the overall art in this book, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit here so we can get a closer look at this part of the cover. Uh, the art is gorgeous throughout. Uh, most of it's new. There's been a couple of pieces here and there that have been uh, repurposed from the first edition books for purposes of, you know, making that art dollar go go farther get us more s cool stuff unlike a lot of the uh, other uh, li like the original core book this is not tied to a specific era although they are leaning into a lot of the strange new worlds aesthetic uh, just because strange new worlds is the flagship show that's actually on the air right now but you've got Voyager DS9 uniforms TNG uniforms strange new world enterprise discovery monster maroons more uh, more strange new worlds I, I think they could have done something a little more actually you know original TOS to get one more uniform oh and the ambassadors uh, in the civvies uh, but that's a, that uh, from an art point is nitpicky it's way more uh, diverse from a you know species standpoint let's get back down to full page here we'll get to that end papers in a minute but as we go through here it's way more diverse in terms of area we've got the 23rd century is well represented you've got TOS uniforms you've got strange new worlds you've got uh, disco season one and two uh, uniforms uh, the 24th century likewise extremely well represented if there's one gripe that I've got uh, It's that it is leaning really hard on the 23rd and 24th centuries. Uh, inside here, I don't recall seeing a single Enterprise era uniform. I don't see remember seeing any 32nd century uh uniforms i don't yeah you know, I, I didn't see any of the prodigy uniforms but that's i i know why some of these things happen it's some of its budgetary some of it is trying to find pieces of art that have that, that convey what you're trying to get across so you're not going to always get everything But, uh, so I mean, that, that's just one of those things that going f forward, I personally would like to see more of is, uh, more Enterprise era illustrations, more, uh, 32nd century uh, Discovery era illustrations but that is a minor uh, complaint on my part uh, because it's got a much wider array uh, of illustrations you've got lots of civilian situations diplomatic encounters you know the the Klingons, the Cardassians, the Feder the uh, the Federation, the Ferengi, are well represented in this book, uh, and I mean that that's on the uh, 
that, that that's just on the uh, the in the, the, the character art a lot of the starship art uh, enterprise is much better represented you you do see several shots of the nx01 or you know nx class ships uh throughout the book and like i say it's a minor it's a minor complaint it's just something i would like to see addressed in future uh supplements and you know knowing jim uh that's not really going to be an issue one special bit of uh of art that i would like to note here are these end papers these are the front end papers the uh it's uh largely the map that s seems to show up a lot in strange new worlds but you've got this gorgeous gorgeous map with all these different star systems and the basic layout of the th big three powers in the um in the 23rd century and the back end covers ah uh, you got this Canon screen timeline, including the Terran universe, but here's the Canon screen, the Prime universe, significant events that happen in the Prime universe, and it's really, really nice. Uh, so, uh, kudos to the design team. For uh, making these part of the book, because you know they're in papers, they could just be blank, but they actually make them useful in this game, which I really, really like. So I'm going to get back to single page mode. There we go. I'm going to show off a little bit here. It's bragging, but. And it really is, but I just think it's really cool. Some of the names that I get to share page count with. A lot of these are names you already know from other uh, from other Star Trek adventures uh, books, but. Uh, this is the one I'm going to fanboy squeal about a little bit right now. Dr. Aaron McDonald is the science advisor for the entire Star Trek franchise. And she is uh, well represented in this book. Uh, almost all the there's a lot of cool science stuff that she wrote. She's a gamer. She she plays our game, and now she writes for our game. This is not actually her first. She's got a a mission brief pack, which I'll I'll link later on. But I just am really chuffed about that. So I thought I'd I'd show off a little bit. Like I say, I know it's bragging, but... And here's the uh, Forward by Jim, the basic introduction. You're going to see a lot of these little sidebars. These are uh, some of the iconic characters. They're the pregens from the Quick Start. They are also on the cover. So, uh, this is a nice touch here this is kind of how they presented some things in the old uh, d6 uh star wars role-playing games they had iconic characters telling you about different uh about different things and they're 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 fun to read uh 
One thing that I want to point out, let me find, ah, here we go. The thing that I should have pointed out when I was talking about the art earlier, and I didn't, is that every individual piece of art, except maybe like the line art that they get from the, the, the Paramount uh, Depository, Every piece of art is individually credited uh, because Jim rightly believes that the artists should get credit. And I imagine this is also a time-saving measure. That way when somebody says, who did this piece of art on page 219? We can just look at page 219 and see who did the art. So uh, part of it is, yes, artists deserve credit for their work. Another part is uh, time saving. The Star Trek primer. A lot of you, like me, honestly, might be tempted to just kind of go past it. I would recommend not doing that because with almost 60 years of uh, of Star Trek lore out there, even uh, even know-it-alls like me might find something that they've forgotten or didn't know in the first place. Uh, I. I generally don't have a problem admitting there are things I don't know. Uh, I'm not as knowledgeable about Voyager, for instance, as uh, as some people are. But there is a lot of good information inside, and a lot of the sidebars you're, you're going to. To, to find here uh, in character now that we've got all the TV shows and, and, and movies as part of the license there are bits from Lower Decks this particular sidebar is uh, is from Tendi's point of view for instance Uh, there are logs from uh, I know Zero's got a log in here. There, there are logs from the Prodigy characters. Uh, we've got all sorts of stuff. But don't skip over the uh, don't skip over the, the, the start. Give it at least one solid read. Go through it and the eras of play. I've got some nice, nice bits and pieces in here as, as well. Anyway, this is formatted as a sidebar. This is a two page sidebar on the various technologies through the uh, through the thousand years or so of Star Trek history. Uh, if you start at first contact in 2063, you're looking at over 1,100 years between first contact and the final season of Discovery. And there's still more coming. But there's a lot of extra information added to the various eras of play. Uh, Another one of my one of my things is I really wish there was more attention paid to the 32nd century, uh, the the far future stuff from Discovery. I know that there just wasn't room, but I'm hoping that leaves room for, you know, 
a source book, Jim, you have all my contact info. You know how to reach me. All right. Then you got this l nice uh, section discussing Starfleet itself. Although it's not, you're not restricted to playing Starfleet. Starfleet is the biggest organization that we see uh, covered in the various shows. And this is another one of those sections that it's tempting for Grognards and Know-It-Alls uh, to zoom past that. And I just think that's... This is another one where you should really give it at least one good solid uh, good solid read through to see what it says in there because there's enough here that'll surprise you. Come on, yeah. Look at this. This is one of my very favorite pieces of art in this entire entire book. And that leads into the science section that uh, Dr. Aaron uh, wrote. Again, don't skip through it. Some of it's old hat, but there's a lot of new information hiding in there. And it's just really, really nice stuff. And now, now we get into uh, what for me is, you know, I always go for the character stuff first. Uh, whether that's a weakness or not, I don't know. But it is how I tend to go about things. It's got a nice section on what goes into a player character, the various attributes and their uses. There's a lot of these infographic things around. There's a lot of great sidebars uh, expanding on, on certain bits here and there. Uh, how the attributes and the departments interact. This talks a bit about stress. Stress does work differently. We talked about that in the uh, discussion we had not long ago on the quick start. Other people have uh, discussed it more in depth than I am probably uh, going to get into here. But it has some discussion on how stress differs, what focuses do. Huge list, page and a half of uh, sample focuses. Uh, just because a focus appears under one particular department doesn't mean that it's only useful in that department. Focuses as... It, long-time players know can often uh, can often have multiple applications so these are just kind of suggestions uh, and then there's for people who have issues coming up with values they've got an entire page full of uh, of possible values. Now, the life path. Uh, still my personal favorite method of, uh, of generating characters. A lot of this is the same as you know from first edition. But because it's not limited to a Starfleet focus like the first edition core book was. 
when you get into it, there's a lot of new stuff, a lot of expansion. Uh, again, infographic with a nice, very clear walkthrough on the various steps of CareGen with the life path. Step one, there are 14 species included in this book. The f eight that originally appeared in the first edition core book with six more. Uh, and they are, and we're just going to zip through these, the Andorians, the Enar, the Bajorans, the Betazoids, the Cardassians, the Denobulans. I love, <laughs> I love this guy. The concept of the Denobulan with dreads, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, the Ferengi, the humans, the Klingons, and this is sure to irritate a few of you, but Discovery happened. It's part of the continuity, and I've got no problem with this guy. The Orions, Romulans, Tellarites, Trill, Vulcans. You can also get uh, some rules on augments and cyborgs. So if you want to have a character like uh, Kayla Detmer or Arium from Discovery, you can. If you want to have a Julian Bashir or a Dalarel, you can. There are... Uh, there are some rules in here for that. There are some specific talents later on in the talent section. One of the new features of the uh, second edition, uh, every species has a species ability. Um, Part of this was for races like Betazoids and, and Klingons. Um, Betazoids, they get telepathy for free, so it doesn't have to take up a, uh, a talent slot. Klingons get Brock Lul for free, so it doesn't have to take up a, uh, a talent slot. But, you know... The Zenobulans, for instance, theirs is called Breadth of Study. They get two additional focuses. And this is different for every, uh, for every species. You know, humans get Faith of the Heart, uh, which is covered in... You, you can see the specifics of uh, Faith of the Heart in the Quick Start right this very minute if you want to. But yeah, the environments are the same selection of environments you had in uh, in first edition. Uh, even with that, if you've got the player's guide, you can still use the player's guide uh, alternate environments. Uh, to generate characters with because the process is the very same thing. Uh, the career paths, this is where the most difference uh, in the core book experiences. There's like eight different career paths and just because it says Starfleet here does not mean that you are automatically in Starfleet, but you've got Starfleet officers enlisted in Starfleet. Uh, Starfleet Intelligence, want to play Section 31? You can do that. Then you've got all these ci civilian uh, options, the Diplomatic Corps, civilian physicians, scientists, uh, officials, and traders. But when it says Starfleet, that can just be a a stand-in for the Klingon Defense Force, or the Bajoran Militia, or, or the Vulcan Expedition Exploratory Fleet. My, my mistake. Sorry about that. 
it is whichever uh, whichever military uh, leans out and says, hey, you can do this. Again, if you've got the player's guide, you can use it. And there's even more options in the player's guide for building your characters. But you've got a ton of stuff just here in the core book. Experience, basically the same. Uh, the untapped potential and the veteran talents. These are the only two talents that are not in the big talent list at the end of the, uh, uh, you know, not at the end, later in the chapter. Uh, career events, that is basically the same. Finishing touches. There's not a lot that has changed. Deri some of the derived stats are different. You're going to need uh, to, to figure those out differently than you would for first edition. Uh, character roles have been expanded. There are a lot of them. Not all of them are you know, specific to Starfleet. Uh, I don't think it included the uh, chef other roles bodyguard, experts, intelligence agents merchants political liaisons, translators no it didn't include the uh, the chefs from the, the, the Klingon core book but I'm sure that will reappear at some point or you can just go look at the Klingon core rule book if you happen to have that sitting around. Creation and play also has a nice uh, summary flow chart. I'm starting to dig this a little more. This is definitely something I'd choose for newer gamers, especially if they're they're younger uh, because it gets them in it doesn't lock them into something and it lets let you learn the character as you go. Let you learn the setting a little more as you go if you're uh, a starting with uh, new players. How, uh, what supporting characters are, how to use them. Uh, largely uh, the same. Most of the stuff is the stuff we've already discussed. Derived stats and things of that nature. Now talents, this is where a lot of the changes has taken place because just in case you didn't know, there are no more challenge dice. Everything is D20s. Uh, things uh, get modified with uh, momentum and threat. More on that in a minute. But uh, you got a metric crapload of talents. Uh, all the species talents that used to be listed on individual species in uh, first edition, they're all here. Uh, alphabetical by the species, by the way. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're looking for a Klingon talent, look for Klingon first and then find the. Uh, <laughs> And then find the talent that you're looking for. Uh, but you get some augment and cybernetic talents uh, from... Uh, I think these originally appeared in the Science Division book. Uh, you got some esoteric ta talents. So in case you want to have a human with ESP and, and throw them through the galactic barrier and cause yourself an enormous amount of peril, you can do that because we've got ESP. Uh, but then you get the command talents. I lost track around 80 or so. But there's loads more here in the core book than were in the first edition core book. 
the development system is what wound up in the uh, Klingon core or the uh, the rules digest from the tricorder set keeping keeping logs keeping copious notes uh, connecting things to your values and mission directives there's a form at the back of the book I'll show you that here shortly uh, to help you keep track of things GMs, I encourage you to print a ton of these things and just have them in a in a fold ready to pass out. Uh, but things you can do with all your yeah, the awards. These a lot of these originally appeared in the command division source book. Uh, and then we get into ships. The ship building chapter, which is just as comprehensive as the uh, as the, the the characters, the basic basics of it are the same. You take a space frame, you put add the mission profile to that space frame, you select some talents, and you have a starship. Because every starship, A, is its own character, and B, even though they're all the same class, they all do slightly different things. Missions missions vary. You might have one Constitution class that's equipped as a multi-role explorer, like the Enterprise, and then you might turn around and have one that's, you know, the President's flagship that could be fitted with, you know, a, a diplomatic package. But like you get in the player's characters section, the various systems and what you can use them for, the various departments and what they get used for, the interactions thereof, how you get your uh, various derived stats for starships also changed. You're going to want to read through this. Uh, to get all the all the specifics, a nice rundown on various uh, various stations and consoles that can be used by the uh, by your players. You get your nice uh, flow chart here. Oh wait. I forgot something uh, that I was going to mention in the uh, in the character creation process. Most of that is the same, like we saw in the uh, in in the quick start. You also get a pastime, uh, which uh, is it, just it, it's something you like to do. You know, you're a photographer, or you like to play Dom Jot, or you, uh, you, you, you're into, you know, 20th century hair metal bands. Uh, it's not something that's going to come up all the time, but it is something that if you can convince your GM to do it, you can use it as an additional focus. Actually, it's not going to come up very often, but it is something that can come up. Something that's similar that comes up for starships is the service record. We'll get to that in just a minute, but basically it is... Uh, well, let's take a look here. Uh, what it does, it gives your ship an additional trait. Uh, also provides some little special rules, and we'll we'll take a look at that here shortly when we get there but it's all 
the same and not the same. Uh, and I've been saying that a lot, but it's it's true. A lot of things are very similar. They're not identical, but a lot of this has been cleaned up. Now the space frames. Some of there there are some special rules that some of them come with. Here are the ships that are included in the core book: the NX, the Constitution, the Excelsior, the Ambassador, the California class, the Galaxy class, the Intrepid class the Sovereign class, the Constitution 3, the ship that I kind of fell in love with in Picard Season 3, and then you've got a few non-Starfleet. Uh, you got the Klingon D7 and the Burrell. you got the Talis Bird of Prey and the Dideridex Warbird, a Galar class Cardassian uh, cruiser, and a Decora Marauder for the Ferengis. Uh, and then you get a bunch of mission profiles. Some of these were taken from... Well, all of them were ultimately lifted from uh, Utopia Planitia, but some of them originated, uh, like Battlecruiser originated in the uh, Disco uh, uh, campaign guide. Words are hard. But you got a nice array. A lot of them are mostly for not just for Starfleet, but they're, they're definitely leaning more towards the uh, Organized militaries, the Klingon Defense Force, the Imperial Navy for the Romulans, things like that. I would like to see some more... I'd like to see some civilian space frames and some civilian, more civilian uh, mission profiles, you know, merchant marines and things like that. But here, here's some of the things for service record... Uh, And there's only X number, there's only like six of these uh, included here. But that leaves room for, room for supplements, baby. That's what we want is, you know, more stuff uh, coming out later. But none of this, none of this uh, does away with anything from first edition. You could take any of this stuff and apply it to... Uh, space frames from Utopia Planitia. One thing I, I do like is the fact that the uh, mission profiles now include a point for increasing a specific system to more tweak the ship towards the utility of that particular mission profile. So, you know, scientific and survey operations, your computers go up by one. Uh, you can increase any system you want for multi-role explorers. Uh, I have not sat and done the math to see if they just took a point off of the uh, system points for a particular space frame uh, to be re replaced with the uh, point that comes with the mission profile. I suspect that they have been, but actually I haven't sat down and compared uh, all the system points for the various uh, space frames to see for sure. Maybe we'll do that in another video one of these days. Let me know if you want me to do that in the comments. Refits, largely the same. Every, every 10 years. Not quite as many Starship talents as character talents, but it's a close thing. Uh... 
Weapons have changed a bit because no challenge dice means weapons ratings are uh, are different. There are about a bajillion types of energy weapons and a bunch of different delivery systems uh, which have slightly different benefits. Again, you want to read over them. Again, way more torpedoes than possibly we could ever need, but there's a bunch there in case you have some use for them. A lot of the small craft uh, stuff is uh, basically the same. I like the fact that these are just basically templates. They don't list, you know, the 4011 different kinds of shuttlecraft that you see on screen. Uh, they're all just shuttlecraft. Uh, the runabout. You could also take these, pretty much these same stats and use it as the, uh, as the long-range shuttle that Spock, Sulu, and Uhura were in in the uh, animated series episode, The Slaver Weapon. Uh, without having to do anything different with the stats. Uh, so I, I, I like that. Uh, the weapons and gear chapter, aside from the you know the, the different uh, damage stats for uh, for the weapons because of no uh, no challenge dice, mostly the same. Read over the weapons qualities. Let's see, some of those have have, have changed. Uh, Lots of neat stuff. I love this picture. Anyway, there's lots of neat stuff in that chapter. I'm not going into things in great detail because this thing is getting long enough already. But um, the basic rules. Uh, there is a lot. This is the section that you know you're going to want to go over multiple times just to make sure you've got the basics down. I have not fully assimilated everything in here yet. You know, it, it starts off talking about scenes and encounters and goes more into depth on traits. Uh, I want what I what I have assimilated so far uh, is has given me a brand new appreciation for traits, something I never really used much in first edition, if I'm honest, because a lot of that uh, I was still trying to absorb, you know, seven plus years ago, and I was most of the groups that I was running, I wound up being, you know, teaching the system to a lot of new players. Some of them new to Star Trek in general, but. So we were learning the system as we go. So I didn't use a lot of this. I mean, there's uh, you know, the, the basics of tasks uh, remain the same. Yeah. The GM assigns a target number. You figure it out with your attribute and department. The GM assigns a difficulty. You grab at least two D20s and you roll some dice. There are some specifics. Uh, regarding re-rolls and, and assists that have changed. Um, I'm not going to comment on everything. As, as I said earlier, I'm still assimilating the rules. I do like that examples are profuse. There are a lot of examples um, Lots of extra guidance and sidebars, but there are bunches and bunches of examples to show you how some of this works. I'm not 100% sure that all of them are taken directly out of the shows, out of specific episodes, 
But knowing Nathan and, and how he did a lot of the examples in first edition, uh, the vast majority of these are situations that actually happened on screen. Flow charts. Like I said earlier, these are all over the book and they are enormously valuable. Some discussion on momentum and determination uh, and threat. All right. One of my contributions to this book. I did not get to do nearly as much in here as I wanted to, but one thing I did do was this techno babble table. Uh, which I'm very happy with how it came out. I'm very happy, ultimately, with how the medical babble table came out, although it wasn't what I originally wanted. I was really trying to come up with something very similar to the, uh, the, the Trekno babble table. Back here, I just just couldn't do it. I, I, I spent three days of writing trying to come up with a medical battle table like that first one. And my oldest brother is, he was a paramedic in the Air Force. Um, my sister-in-law, emergency responder, paramedic, and he's my uh, 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 my other sister-in-law, my, my wife's sister, nurse, my sister, nurse. We got a lot of medical stuff going on in the family. I just couldn't make myself come up with, uh, with, with, with that random babble type of table. So what we wound up with is a lot of esoteric injuries that can... You can have your medical uh, players stumble upon uh, what might have caused it and various different treatments for it. And I know it's not what some people are going to want in a medical babble table, and I'm sorry. But I am uh, pretty happy with how it came out ultimately even though it wasn't what I originally wanted. Now we start getting into things like challenges and, again, lots of examples. Uh, extended tasks, extended consequences are, are a thing now. Uh, some nice examples of, uh, of how those work. And then we get into conflict. Again, since I haven't completely assimilated all the rules, you're just going to kind of breeze through here. But many, many examples. The one thing I, I didn't see... I'm gonna, let me flip through here. Yeah, I didn't see, like, there's not really a flow chart in the social conflict. Although there is for, uh, within personal conflict and also within starship combat. The broad strokes... Again, remain the same. There's a nice long set of things that you can do for various departments in Starship Conflict. flow charts, how damage works. Let's see. How damage works is, like I said, different because of uh, challenge dice not being here. Uh, you got a base damage 
And then you start applying various things that you can do with momentum and threat. Uh, gonna take a quick pause here, in fact. Because momentum and threat in, uh, in, in second edition much more meant to be much more fluid uh, and and active don't as players don't be afraid to give the GM threat because it's how interesting things can happen uh, as GMs you know don't be afraid to to, to re, you know to, to reward the, the players with momentum because that is meant to be a vibrant and oscillating for lack of a better term economy uh, because you know, it, it should be moving up and down up and down up and down up and down because momentum is used for so many things threat is used for so many things uh, and I'm actually this is not how I'm going to get into uh, how we should be getting into it uh, we'll have a lot of discussions down the road on how the various rules work and interact, especially as I start getting used to more of them. This is just a overview on 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 the core book, and I'm probably going off into the weeds a lot. And I am sorry about that. It's just kind of how things go with me sometimes. But I said there are a lot of examples. The game mastering section. Now there's a lot to unpack in here. But it gives you, again, a nice flow chart. This is something they started using. I can't remember if they, if they uh, you know, started using them in, uh, in Captain's Log or... If that was just where they, you know, really began to shine, but these uh, these flow charts but there are a lot of lots of guidance on how to do things, uh, how to get things moving, how to administer tasks, a lot of guidance on using traits, because as I have noted before. Traits are a big deal. They're a much bigger deal uh, than than the uh, first edition. Uh, or I may have just missed it because, as I said, I was dealing with a lot of new players and I was still learning the system myself. So it's entirely possible, even years later, that I am missing things. But dealing with traits, dealing with values and directives, a lot of guidance on how to use threat. Lots of varying threat spends. Some nice guidance and, and, and more rules on how to use the extended task and the extended consequences. Then we get to the introductory adventure, which I have not really looked at. Partly still assimilating rules, partly because I am hoping against hope that someone will take pity on me and run me through this as a player. I, I, I want to actually play this, so I have not looked at this really much at all. I'm going to... And then we get to allies and adversaries. We're almost to the end of the book, guys. We're, we're almost done here, which is fantastic because, God, we've been doing this for what seems like forever. Uh, explanation of the various types of NPCs and how, how things work with them. A lot of this is, is the same basics that you're going to get with... Uh, from first edition, but specifics have changed. Uh, some of the special rules have changed because of the various uh, 
various changes to you know how stress works, how um, how weapons damage works, things of that nature. If anything, if I had a complaint about this section, is that I feel like it's a little light. Um, you got your usual suspects, but with some of the emphasis going on with the uh, with Strange New Worlds, with it being the you know the the, the flagship at the moment. Uh, I was kind of expecting some Gorn bad guys. Uh, I was exp certainly expecting and hoping for more, for some kind of you know sneaky species stuff like we got in first edition. Uh, it's a little bit harder to play that Gem Hadar. Uh, <laughs> Then, uh, then it might have been because you don't get the the species mods. The 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 NPC starships are also kind of light, but again, you still got all those first edition books where you can pull ships out. And do a couple of quick tweaks, and you're you're ready and and able to move on. I would like to have seen some more civilian vessels, but again, we're. I I know that Jim spent a lot of late nights going through or going. Oh God, what what can I cut because. You know, he, he wound up cutting a bunch of stuff because the book uh, would have had its own gravity well if he hadn't cut a bunch of stuff out of here. So you got a few critters. I am both uh, amused and terrified that the galaxy's most dangerous Pokemon uh, is uh, featured within these the, these pages. The Gamato, Mugato, however you want to pronounce it, because everyone knows there's about a dozen pronunciations. Um, and that's it. And then you got your, you know, you got your uh, character sheet, you got your ship sheet, and that personal log. Like I said, GMs print out a bunch of these things and just have them handy, ready to hand to your players. Players, if you want to, you know. Be nice. Print your own. But you, th th these are things that will be very helpful uh, with like the advancement system, as as we discussed earlier. And then you've got a nearly four-page, fairly comprehensive uh, index. And guys, that's it. We have reached the end of that book. And I I think it's a great book. I, I think it's a lot cleaner. The organization is so much better uh, for my ADHD smooth little brain. Um, and there's so much more uh, that can be done straight from the core you, you you don't have to play starfleet you don't have to play you know a, a federation species you can you can start out with klingons you can start out with you know, with, with cardassians and romulans if you if you so choose uh since the majority of star trek shows do revolve around starfleet you know the the federation and starfleet does play a huge role in this but um it's not the only way you can go about it so uh if you have any questions or or, or uh or ideas 
leave them in the comments down below. Let me know what you think. Uh, let me know how you feel about this. Don't forget to like and subscribe and do all the algorithm stuff that uh, that, that makes me show up in, on YouTube. Uh, and I will be doing this hopefully more frequently going forward. Guys, it has been... It's been nice getting back. So, until next time, live long and prosper. And we will catch you on the next one.